So, welcome to the last module um, of this course where we will be discussing molecular dynamics simulations and uh, the in this part we will be talking about classical molecular dynamics. There can also be quantum molecular dynamics. So, in classical molecular dynamics uh, simulations we are doing nothing more than integrating Newton's equations of motions for a large number of interacting particles. So, basically there are particles they are moving around in space and you are following the position coordinates and the velocity coordinates of the particles. The physics of the problem is decided I mean what you want to study uh, the physics of the problem is decided by the interaction potential. So, depending upon uh, what physics you are studying uh, you choose different uh, expressions of the interaction potential. So, if you are doing Newton's equation of motion it is nothing but solving m d 2 r d t 2 equal to minus grad of v, v being the interaction potential you choose different um, potentials depending upon the physics of the problem and on solving this uh, second order differential equation you essentially get uh, positions and velocities or positions or momenta as a function of time. Here i is the particle index. Uh, of course, you are not looking at just one particle, but you have a bunch of particles interacting with each other. right? So, in molecular dynamic simulations you are essentially looking at the time evolution of a system of particles and if you are doing statistical physics uh, then once uh, equilibrium is reached you can take the statistical uh, time average. So, here you are basically taking time average in molecular dynamic simulations. In Monte Carlo simulations the Ising model which we discussed uh, previously you are taking the ensemble average the system was going from one microstate to the other different copies of the ensemble. Here also the system is going uh, if the system is in an equilibrium the system is going from one microstate to the other, but as a function of time. So, when you take a statistical average you are essentially taking a time average of the system. However, in molecular dynamics one can also study the time evolution of a non-equilibrium system. Suppose your initial coordinates the positions and the velocities of the system of particles they are not in equilibrium they are in some special uh, initial condition. Then you can also study how the system is moving towards equilibrium especially since you have access to positions and velocities of all the particles and you are doing a classical simulation just integrating Newton's equation of motion. right? So, um, uh, what would be uh, the picture what you will have is a simulation box with PBC, PBC being periodic boundary condition. So, here you have a box blue colored right and within that you have many particles which are basically moving around in space. So, I have labeled 1, 2, 3 and here you have i and you could uh, i uh, plus 1. In general you could have n particles in a box of volume v you can take a cubic box you can also take a spherical box and uh, so on so forth. But here we have periodic boundary condition remember you can also have a box with walls. So, you can have also a confined system and you uh, see how the particles are moving around due to interaction with each other as well as when they reach the wall they could collide with the wall and come back into the system. right? So, basically you are trying to model nature with the appropriate potential. And uh, so, you have n particles in a volume of box V and uh, you could also uh, basically fixed uh, you are looking you will typically be looking at the system at a fixed temperature. You can also change temperature there is no problem if you want to look at a system at different temperatures then you also can change the temperature. How do you decide how do you measure the temperature it is by equipartition theorem which holds an equilibrium where half m v i square for a particle uh, equal to half k b t. Now, this is for every degree of freedom right. So, this would be like v x square half m v x square in uh, um, half m v x square expectation value average value equal to half k b t 
and that is what the equilibrium equipartition theorem says. In general, if you have uh, n particles and if you are in 3 D and you have 3 n degrees of freedom. So, then 3 n m v uh, square over all the particles. So, basically you are uh, calculating the total kinetic energy of all the particles and expectation value of that will be equal to 3 by 2 n k b t. Here the Hamiltonian is of the form p i square by 2 m summation i equal to 1 to 3 n. So, basically half I mean p i square by 2 m is also nothing but half m v square. So, you have half m v x square plus v y square plus v z square it is um, every degree of freedom. So, basically if, if I was the particle index then I would run from 1 to n. However, this uh, I corresponds here to the degree of freedom. So, in three dimensional space you have v the x is one degree of freedom, y is another degree of freedom, z is another degree of freedom and if you have n particles i runs from 1 to 3 n and this is the potential term. Now, for equipartition theorem you might uh, know that only terms which are quadratic in the Hamiltonian like p i square by 2 m is quadratic in the Hamiltonian. So, only if you have terms in the Hamiltonian uh, where uh, basic uh, it is uh, appears as a whole square p i p i being uh, the momentum whole square kinetic energy only then does the equipartition theorem hold. So, you cannot say that half of potential energy um, average potential uh, energy is related to half k b t I mean per degree of freedom right. Um, so, here we have considered a potential which is basically dependent upon the position of two particles, but in general you can have a, a potential uh, which is a three body interaction, four body interaction it can depend if it is a three body interaction it will depend upon r i, r j, r k, r these are basically the um, position index of three different particles it could also depend upon theta you could have a theta dependent uh, potential you could have a where theta is essentially the angle. So, uh, between uh, uh, vectors. So, suppose uh, suppose that this is a particle, this is a particle, this is a particle and suppose uh, they are connected like this. So, this is I say this is J and suppose this is K uh, and then uh, basically R I minus R J. So, you will basically have this vector and then you will have another vector like this. So, if you have a three body interaction uh, you it uh, the potential will depend upon all, all the relative values of r i and r j and also on theta. It could I mean so, it depends as I told you the form of the potential depends upon the physics of the problem right and you could have also have torsion terms if need be I mean angle dependent potentials as I said. So, in this course we will be basically looking at a canonical ensemble where we uh, we are fixing uh, n v and t. So, number of particles fixed, volume fixed and temperature fixed, but uh, you could also look uh, at constant pressure simulation. So, when you uh, fix a pressure, so then you would basically look at the n p t simulation number of particle fixed, pressure fixed which means volume can fluctuate and uh, the instantaneous volume can fluctuate of course, you will have an average volume. And uh, you fix the temperature. Of course, e each of these coordinates can also be changed, but then you are changing the system, not the system, not the interaction, but you are taking a, uh, the system at a higher temperature or a higher pressure or a, uh, if you are changing V, keeping n constant, then you are changing the density of the system and so on and so forth. Right? So, we will be considering N V T, but you can also do N P T simulations molecular dynamic simulations. As I told you particles move around as per the interaction potential the potential de uh, determines whether there is an attraction between them then particles will come close together and uh, depending upon the density number of particles by volume temperature pressure one could um, identify whether the 
a set of interacting particles is a liquid, a gas, a solid, there could be many other phases. Uh, depends upon again, I mean there could be the pneumatic phase, there could be a complex um, uh, crystalline phase and so on and so forth. So, as I told you uh, the molecular dynamics simulation, the physics of the problem is decided by <coughs> uh, the potential. You could even using molecular dynamics simulations look at how Neptune is going around the sun. But if you are looking at Neptune, then uh, we are basically looking at is the Newton's uh, gravitational law g m m by r square and of course, Neptune or whatever planet or, or whatever you are interested to look at, it would be affected uh, by not only the sun, but by the earth, Jupiter, Saturn and so on and so forth, Pluto, asteroid belt and so on and so forth. So, um, if you were looking at gravitational potential you would have the 1 by r square. If you are looking at a charge system, uh, you would be looking at uh, the Coulomb interaction, this is 1 by r. So, gravitational potential Coulomb interactions, these are typically long range interactions. They really act as 1 by r and uh, this 1 by r fall off can be felt over very large distances. right? Uh, but in principle, you can do molecular dynamic simulation with that, but the calculation of long range forces is slightly more complicated. Uh, you have to calculate part of the uh, force in uh, Fourier space and some in real space and so on and so forth. So, we will be mainly concerned with short range forces. The calculation method will remain the same if you have interactions like this calculation of force becomes slightly more complicated, but rest of the algorithm uh, remains the same. If you are doing a molecular dynamic simulations with short range forces, it is it's slightly simpler than um, dealing with long range forces. For this, since you are just learning the principle of molecular dynamics and you will calculate some quantities, we will take the simpler problem of a problem with short range uh, forces. Having said this, uh, what does actually molecular dynamics simulations entail going to a slightly more detail than what I have been discussing up till now. Basically, you will have n particles. So, you initialize uh, the position of and velocity of n particles. right? Now, if you have a potential, then uh, if you know the position of the particles, you can calculate the force acting on each particle. Once you know the force and you already have the velocity because you have initialized it, you can update the position and the velocities of the particles. So, you have the new positions and the new velocities of the particles, Newton's law that is what Newton's law tells you. And once you have the new positions, you can calculate the new force, right. Uh, so, you have access to the new force. Moreover, you should uh, collect data to calculate your relevant statistical quantities. Right, because the particles are going to move. Basically, if you are looking at the statistical averages, you could be identifying a phase, you could be identifying the dynamics and that is all that is there in molecular dynamics simulation, just three steps. Initialize position, calculate force, update position and velocities, calculate new force with that, update the position and velocities and with that, uh, calculate new force and do this n iteration time. So, then you get basically get a trajectory of all the particles in space. At the end of your simulations after n iteration simulations, how many iterations to choose of course, those are details we shall come to it when we actually implement it and um, implement the code. So, um, at the end of the simulation you analyze the physics using either stat phase or if you are doing uh, suppose some uh, uh, solving the Newton's equation for uh, suppose um, uh, the planets in the solar system. Um, so, you can do it, you want the trajectory, you could use astronomy, you could look at interaction between galaxies. Again, as I said, I mean what you want to do with it what potential you use, whether it be galaxy be easier unit or planet or smaller particles, nanoparticles or uh, interacting liquids that that is decided by 
uh, or the physics decides the v of r, but the molecular dynamics simulations just tells you how to integrate Newton's equation of motion efficiently and in a reliable manner. Right, that is all that is there to it actually. But you will see, though it sounds so simple, there are complications which you will have to be aware of. If you just do it naively, you will get uh, soon get infinities. The simulation is not going to work. So uh, the reasons uh, molecular dynamics uh, simulations is being taught at the end of the course is because it uh, there is a lot of scope for error it is more complicated than any of the things that you have learned before uh, in principle it is simple it's just you have to be a bit more careful about various aspects we will come to it as we go along the course so message uh, we are essentially solving 3n differential equations for position 3n differential uh, equations for velocity in molecular dynamics and keep calculating force and with this new force keep updating these quantities right so that's uh, all that is there now updating the expression for the position and velocity of the particles right this is a relatively very easy step all that one has to do um, is calculate a suitably small value of delta t the delta t basically uh, here you are discretizing time right when you solve the di differential equation uh, continuously uh, in in, a, in in your analytic course so then time is nearly continuous delta t goes to zero but here you want to take a finite you have to take a finite you are discretizing time and saying okay i'm looking at the positions at time t1 at time t2 at time t3 t2 minus t1 is constant t3 minus T2 is constant and so on and so forth and uh, dt uh, that the value of uh, dt or delta t has to be small enough that the Newton's equations are integrated correctly and of course, we will check uh, whether they are being uh, integrated uh, correctly or not, but uh, though delta t has to be small enough uh, if you want to look at a very long trajectory you also want it to be large enough I mean you do really do not want to uh, look at uh, take the smallest possible delta t you want to take the largest possible uh, permissible delta t which allows you to integrate Newton's equation of motion correctly right if you have a too large a delta t then your newton's equation won't be calculated correctly it won't be updated correctly you won't get the right solution to the newton's equation of motion interacting by a potential if you take a very small delta t then to have a large trajectory you will have a extremely long uh, number of iterations you will have to wait for days for the simulation to complete so you want to really take a small enough delta t, but large is permissible, right? So that your simulation uh, runs quickly, and you can get your uh, you can sit down to analyze your physics results. Uh, what I was saying is that the calculation of positions and uh, velocities update of this. There is a relatively very cheap and um, cheap, computationally cheap process. It's a easy process. How, however, calculating the force is relatively difficult and computationally expensive and why is that because you have to calculate the force uh, for between a particle and all other n particles because in in practical uh, in practice the interaction could go to infinity right of course there are steps to handle this aspect you uh, especially for short range forces you want, do not want an n cross n calculation you want to reduce it we will discuss that, but in principle uh, here for each calculation of force you have to calculate the force between each pair of particles which is a n cross n process and then you have to calculate the distance and the expression whereas this part if you have n particles you have n steps or rather 3 n steps to update position and update velocity right so um, so large part when i say that we will be discussing mole, uh, molecular dynamic simulation a large part of the discussion will actually be 
about this aspect and not this aspect. This is trivial as you shall see. Uh, at the beginning, at the introduction, uh, even before I go uh, get down to the details, uh, let me tell you um, uh, what uh, molecular dynamics simulations gives. Uh, you know you have position and velocity at each uh, instant in time, but you can also study a system with a so called off lattice Monte Carlo simulations. We did a lattice Monte Carlo simulations in the Ising model right in the previous module of the course, but you could also look at a, a system of interacting particles by Monte Carlo simulations. And if you have potentials and particles can move around in space, you can have an off lattice uh, Monte Carlo simulations as well. So, let me compare uh, what advantages you have with Monte Carlo simulations, what uh, advantages you have with molecular dynamic simulations, when should one do a molecular dynamic simulations and not be happy enough with a uh, off lattice Monte Carlo simulations. Typically, Monte Carlo simulations are much faster than molecular dynamic simulations, but before I compare, uh, um, I have to briefly tell you what is an off lattice Monte Carlo simulation right, only then can I uh, can you compare, the, only then can I compare and only then can you take a judicious decision whether you want to do your, uh, you want to study a system by Monte Carlo or by molecular dynamics. Uh, so, what one does in a Monte Carlo simulation is one takes a box. Uh, just like in molecular dynamics and these red uh, dots are essentially a uh, large number of particles which are distributed in space. So, if for each you have an x coordinate, no v coordinate, no velocities in uh, Monte Carlo uh, simulations. So, you, what you have is the x coordinate of each of these uh, particles right and in uh, and uh, space is continuous. So, the particles can occupy any point in space, it is not that they have to occupy certain discrete point in space. If that is true, then you would call that, uh, you would call that essentially a lattice. So, here particles can move around in space, even if the even if they are sitting in a lattice, if we are looking at a crystal, uh, they might be sitting on a lattice, but may, they might be jiggling around due to thermal energy right. So, then space is again continuous, I mean they can move con in continuous space about its average lattice position that is what atoms do right, I mean in a crystal. And in a liquid or in a gas uh, basically they move all around the space, I mean uh, it is not that they can occupy only discrete points on a lattice and move around that uh, right. So, so, coming back to Monte Carlo simulations, these particles are basically uh, occupying different points in space, they are not overlapping and to perform a Monte Carlo simulation, what one does is randomly choose a particle. In Ising model, we were choosing a uh, randomly choosing a spin in the lattice, here we are just randomly choosing a particle using a random number generator. Um, if we want to give it a displacement. Uh, um, so, in Ising model we were giving a flip, so if, uh, if the spin was pointing up we were giving a flip, um, we are basically changing the, uh, by change giving the spins a flip we were changing the microstate of the system and then we would decide whether we would accept or reject the uh, trial spin flip. Here what we are going to do is uh, give a displacement in a random direction to particle i right. So, we, we will give a trial displacement of particle i in a random direction by uh, this uh, delta r i, but before we give the random uh, displacement we calculate the initial energy of the system right just like we calculated the initial energy in a uh, in the Ising model case. Then after uh, giving a random displacement. So, suppose this particle, uh, this particle would have moved uh, somewhere here. Uh, so, that would change, uh, that would result in a change of the interaction between this particle and the other particles, a change in the potential energy of the system. And so, we calculate E f, the 
the new energy after the displacement, uh, trial displacement. Now, just as in the Ising model, if delta E, if the change in energy is less than 0, if the energy decreases, then we accept the move. Else, we accept this trial displacement move with probability e to the power minus delta E by k b t. If delta e is, e is positive, then we accept it with probability e to the power minus delta E by k b t. And if we repeat this uh, choosing a particle n times, where n is the total number of particles in the system, then you say that you have done one Monte Carlo step. Right? So, basically you choose a random particle, try to move it, choose another random particle or choose another particle randomly, try to move it and you do this n times and you have essentially generated a different microstate with a different position of particles, a different value of the energy and uh, whether high energy microstates will be accessed or not will depend upon the uh, statistical physics. This is of course, in only in equilibrium. And if you repeat this n MCS times, you would have basically generated uh, so many different uh, microstates of the system and you can calculate your statistical averages. Note, while we were discussing all of this, never once have I been mentioning the word velocity, never mentioned the word kinetic energy. It is just a position based, you are changing the position what is the change in energy, uh, the whether the new microstate will be accessed or not with probability e to the power delta e by k b t or rather e to the power minus beta e i, i being the energy of the microstate by the partition function, right? uh, this is the important sum sampling. But in all of this, there is no mention of velocity, it is just a position based. So, in Monte Carlo simulation, the degree of freedom which you have, which you are working with to different different micro st uh, microstates, be different microstates of the ensemble is x i t. Whereas, in molecular dynamics simulations, which I uh, uh, denote by m d molecular dynamics and Monte Carlo is m c Monte Carlo, you have in molecular dynamics, you have access to both position and velocities. So, this is the key difference. So, if you want the exact trajectory of a spaceship uh, in space, you do molecular dynamics. The interaction might be the same 1 by r, but you cannot do a Monte Carlo because there you are trying out uh, random moves. If you want the exact trajectory of Neptune uh, um, or uh, a spaceship or some galaxy, then you do molecular dynamics. Even when you are looking at uh, suppose uh, solid liquid gas where you are interested in statistical properties of the system and not an astronomical system uh, say, uh, then where if you need to understand the physics of your system, the velocity degree of freedom, then you cannot do a Monte Carlo, because Monte Carlo has only positions. right? Now, suppose you want to calculate the velocity profile of a fluid in shear flow or say in Poisson flow, then you have to do a molecular dynamics. Though Monte Carlo as I told you is faster, it gives you statistical properties faster, but if you want some dynamical properties or you want to look at the uh, approach uh, um, uh, from a non equilibrium system to an equilibrium system, how the system is relaxing, then you would typically do a molecular dynamics simulations. Having said that, let me tell you though we will not discuss it in great detail, one also at times looks at uh, um, the Monte Carlo simulations to look at dynamics or the evolution of a system that is also done, but you do not have access to the velocity degree of freedom. Right? So, this has been a um, general introduction to what and when should we use molecular dynamics, what is the basic ideas of molecular dynamics. Now, slowly let me enter uh, a more gory detail. Okay. As I told you, there is the update of positions and velocities and there is the calculation of force. Right. The simple part is update of velocities and position and whereas, one can also use the Runge-Kutta 
method which was discussed in the differential equation uh, module. What we will discuss in this module is another method is the so called Worley algorithm. Okay. One can also use the um, Runge Kutta, but we will discuss the Worley algorithm and the Worley algorithm has the advantage that the equations of motion that we use to update or to calculate Newton's equation of motion the trajectory of the particles, they are time reversible. So, that is implicitly there, I mean the way uh, this um, and the way um, uh, this world algorithm of the update of position and velocity is um, arranged. So, in the world algorithm all that we are using is nothing more than the Taylor series, the Taylor series expansion. Suppose, you have the access uh, to the position and velocity of all the particles, you have initialized the velocity and uh, position of all the particles at time t. Okay. Then you can calculate, <coughs> well if you have the position you have also calculated the force, from force you get the acceleration. Then using Taylor series, uh, you can write down the position of a particle i at time t plus delta t using x i t. So, you need to know the position of the particle at time t uh, plus d x d t right that is what the ta uh, Taylor series expansion says calculated at time t into delta t plus half d 2 x d t 2 double derivative calculated at time t. So, this is nothing uh, but the acceleration acceleration can be calculated from the force into delta t whole square plus higher order terms. Right. Similarly, you can write x i at t minus delta t at time previous as x i t you are doing just a Taylor series expansion nothing more than that, but of course, this thing is nothing but the velocity this thing is nothing but the acceleration and if you have x t minus delta t the only difference that you get is you have a negative sign here instead of a positive sign the other terms remain the same. Now, if you add this equation and the, this equation, right? if you add these two equations, then uh, you essentially get x t plus delta t, the position of particle i at time t plus delta t, uh, you get 2 x i t uh, calculated at time t, acceleration at time t into delta t whole square and uh, basically if you add it, uh, I bring this term to the right hand side of the equation. So, this is your expression. So, using Taylor series, if you want the position of time at t plus delta t, you need the position at time t, the position at time t, right? the acceleration at time t, Moreover, you need the position at time t minus delta t, right. So, two steps back. So, this is how you would calculate it. If you subtract this equation from this equation, then you would get x t plus delta t. So, here you would get x t plus delta t minus x t minus delta t. So, which is you are subtracting and then uh, these terms would cancel and what you would have is uh, d x d t I have written as velocity intentionally because that is what it is calculated at time t into delta t. So, here basically uh, you have just managed to calculate v i at time t right. So, here you have position and uh, which depends upon x t plus delta t and here you can calculate the velocity at any time, but then uh, what you need is the position at time t plus delta t and the position at t time t minus delta t. So, you need uh, these two positions at two different times to be able to calculate this in general. Now, doing a bit of algebra and some mathematical uh, jugglery, you can also write Worley algorithm into the velocity Worley algorithm is just a uh, bit more algebra than that. 
and in the velocity Verley algorithm what you do is uh, x t plus delta t and Verley and velocity Verley are absolutely equivalent. You can even use this or you can use the Verley algorithm. I have a bias towards the velocity Verley algorithm because I use it, but there is nothing holy about it. You can use either of them. So, the velocity Verley algorithm what you do is x t plus delta t equal to x t plus v t into delta t plus half a t delta t whole square. So, you see that this is at time t, this is at time t, this is at time t right and then you get the position at time t plus delta t and the velocity can be written as v velocity at time plus delta t can be written as the velocity as time t. So, the previous time the force or rather I should write the acceleration f t by m is acceleration. So, the acceleration at time t and the acceleration at time t plus delta t. So, you see here again to calculate the velocity at time t, t plus delta t you need the force at two different times including the force at time t plus delta t right. In the previous case to calculate velocity you are needing the position at time t minus delta t. Same here to calculate the position the new position of the particle after time t you are needing the position of the particle at t minus delta t whereas, this has simplified a bit and here all you need to update the position is the position velocity and acceleration at time t. However, to calculate the velocity at time t plus delta t you need the force or the acceleration at the previous time as well as the acceleration at the current instant in time at time t plus delta t. So, in the Verley algorithm you have to update the position first using this equation. Once you have x t plus delta t you can calculate f t plus delta t right because you have the new position or uh, with the new positions you can calculate the new forces save the old force in some other array. So, you have to update the force, save the old force and with these new two forces update velocity and that is all that is there to molecular dynamics repeat. So, you basically if you keep on doing this you have the position, the new position, the new force and the new velocity. So, with that you can calculate the position at time t plus 2 delta t, then you calculate the force at time t plus 2 delta t and then you calculate the velocity at time t plus 2 delta t. You have access to these three immediately you can go to this step and calculate the position at t plus 3 delta t. So, what are you getting? You are getting position, velocity and force at incremental values of time you are getting essentially the trajectory in space x as a function of t uh, as it in as t changes as as the particles move around as time progresses you have the velocity of particles as time progresses as t1 t2 t3 t4 uh, t3 being greater than t2 t2 being greater than t1 right so that is all that is there in the update of uh, position and velocity however you will see that the calculation uh, the force calculation step will take much more time.